Does everybody? I think that there was both a major of them. Okay. We'll, we'll catch them up on everything. All right. What we're going to talk about today is the opioid reversal agent, Narcan, or Doxalone. It just now recently, within the last six months, made available over the counter without a prescription because we've had so many overdoses that you actually have some, uh, from what I understand, some dealers, like pill dealers and stuff like that, heroin dealers, that are actually keeping this on them too. So when their customers do overdose, they can bring them back around. That's crazy. They don't want to kill off their customers. I've heard stories of that now. Basically, the way that you guys are going to utilize it is going to be intranasal. It's going to go up the nose. We'll get these little devices out there, and hopefully we'll get them pretty soon. All it is is it looks like a little cone, literally. And it'll screw on this, half turn, it screws on, and you do half of each nostril. You do it all in one nostril, all you do is run down the back of your throat and not do anything. It can absorb that quick, but you're going to do one, you're going to do a half of each side. Basically, it's what's known as a lower lock. You can screw it on anything. You'll have just your basic Narcan, it's just a little vial, you'll have this applicator right here. This is not as sharp, so you ain't gonna worry about getting stuck. Once you pull the cap off, you don't have to worry about anything sticking in. But what you do have to worry about is, what we always do is we'll pop these caps off, and this does have a sharp up in it, but it is recessed. So unless you stick your finger up there intentionally, it won't get you. Once you pop your caps off, you got a glass bottle, a plastic injector, and then literally, look, it's got like little threads on right here. All you do is you just pull them together, and as soon as you pull them together, that'll actually puncture this, and you just rotate it. And now it punctures the seal on this, go all the way up, and you'll see. If you see, it's marked. It's actually two milligrams in this. You'll want to give them the full, since you're doing it up the nose where the absorption rate's a lot slower, you want to give them the whole thing. But do half of each nostril. That'll give them a full two milligram. Especially with the Percocet, hydrocodones, and everything that's out there right now, that everybody's getting high on. You're probably going to need this and probably maybe a little bit more if it's all said and done. What you're going to do is you're going to pop that off. And the little, the mucosal atomizing device, the little MAD device, well, literally, it'll just screw right on there. And as soon as you do it, Take it and go right up to each nostril. That little cone will be a foam cone. You just want to push it up to the nostril to get a good seat on it, and you push it. And when you push, that little mad device, it'll atomize it. It just makes it into a fine mist, kind of like an Afrin model. You spray Afrin. All that device does is it makes it like that. You'll push half, turn around to the other nostril, push half, and that's all it is to it. And that's, that's basically it in a nutshell. One thing you want to watch out for, though, which I know some of you guys have been on calls with us. I can't remember who was on the call. We were on uh, Uncle Mike Powers that day when we turned old Buddy around, and it was it was on. Like it's you got to you got to be ready when you get on Narcan, especially when they start coming around and it, it immediately burst that high that they got. That was that boy who was laid up on the couch. That was me and you. Yes, the one that took me off the ground with his legs. Okay. Yep. And that was, we just gave him the vein, and as soon as we gave him the vein, I didn't get it unhooked off of him, and he was, he was off, I mean, he was on us like crazy. But when you get to him, expect to have, I mean, anticipate a reaction of that nature, because you just took him completely out of their high. People that are on chronic pain management, that take a little too much, quote unquote, when you get to them, a lot of times they may start coming around, they'll start puking on them, they'll start throwing up, vomiting. So as soon as you give it up the nose, which at this point anyway, you know, you know if they're unconscious in response, they need to be on their side anyway, right? So as soon as you give it up the nose, make sure they're on their side so if they start throwing up, get ready for it. That way it'll just run right out of them. A lot of times they'll puke, we'll just slide them back, keep letting them puke. That way we'll get it out of them. Yeah, that, that way exactly. They don't aspirate, they don't get in their lungs. But the main thing about it is, it's got what's called a short half-life. When you give it, it'll work and you'll think, good job, we got this guy back around, you know, We'll let EMS check them out. Anytime you administer Narcan, you really need to have them transported to the hospital because it will wear off. If they've got so much narcotics in their system that once it's reversed, it may go for 10, 15 minutes, 
and then the effects may come back, especially this new stuff out here that we're seeing with the profentanyl and all this other stuff that nobody knows anything about yet. So I strongly urge you, anybody that you reverse with the North End, you know, if EMS comes on scene, EMS 99.9% .9 of the time know that they need to transport. But sometimes <coughs> you'll have a patient come back around and they'll say, no, I don't want to go to the hospital. I know where I am. I'm conscious alert and orient times three. You're not taking me to the hospital. At that time, you want to definitely make sure that you cover all your bases with everything because that patient has demise, uh, reaches some sort of demise after you leave him there, and technically you're on the hook for it. Or as we know, if these people are already taking this uh, prescription pills to get high, as soon as you leave, what's to say that they're going to go, and you know what? This guy just killed my high. I'm about to go take me some more pills. So those are some things to look at. Just anticipate the vomiting, anticipate the, the combativeness, and they're like crazy strong, freaky strong. I mean, some of the women you look at are 100 pounds, and you think, yeah, this ain't going to be a problem at all. You hit them with that, and you wouldn't believe what kind of things they can do to you, tie you up and grab for stuff. I've had one grab my knife off my side, that keep inside my belt. I've had them grab pins, try to stab me with my own pin, things of that nature. But just anticipate that, anticipate the bombing, you know, protect their airway. And the biggest thing is to make sure that they get transported by EMS. If for some reason EMS gets a refusal on them or, you know, you kind of feel like that they're not really wanting to allow the patient, or if the patient's really getting to where they're not wanting to go to the hospital and EMS is leaning towards them, Hey, we're not going to transport. Call a supervisor about it because they need to go to the hospital, especially with what we got. Any yeah. questions on anything? The stuff that's coming down, coming up into Albany, has moved up further. Yeah, that going to work on that? Yes. Since the CDC hasn't even recognized it yet. Well, it's fur fentanyl. Is what it is. Okay. It's, it's propyl. It's, it's not the fur fentanyl. It's a mixture of the fur fentanyl and a propyl fur fentanyl, which the the great death, which is starting to come into the county. I think it was first seen in Carroll County around this area. The biggest thing is, you may need more than just that. The biggest thing, when you go on someone that's unconscious and you can't get them to wake up, look at their pupils. If their pupils are constricted down, they're high as a kite on an opioid. You know, that is might bash their head in, they got a bad head injury, which I can tell you right now, more than likely it's because they're high as a kite. If they're pinpoint pupils, hit them with this. If they don't start coming around or you don't, they don't start uh, getting, the, if you don't get the response that you expect out of them, you give them half a milligram, or you give them half of each nostril, and they just start coming around, they're still real groggy, they're not looking around really good, you know, they're talking, and you look at their pupils, and they're still pinpoint, hey, Terry, I need yours too. Give them another uh, half vial of each nostril again, because it may be harder to turn them around. Back when, three years ago, we had a batch of heroin come through Calgary County up in the Northgate District, and I ran a guy, he was 17 years old, 18 years old, Probably 70 kilos, average build, high as a kite. Looked at his pupils, their pinpoint, I stood IV in, gave him two milligrams, did touch him. I thought, man, you know, what am I, what am I not seeing here? Hit him with another two milligrams, I started getting around him. After six milligrams, three of these little vials, he got to where he could actually breathe on his own better and talk to me somewhat. Because of all that potent batch of heroin that, come, that came through that area. You know, that was. The most I've ever given anybody is about four vials of these to go and come around, and I still haven't even know what to roll in. Well, there was an officer that came in contact with fentanyl. He took ten. Yeah. yeah. You got to think when you talk, start talking about the fentanyl, the fentanyl craze right now that's going around. People don't understand how potent fentanyl is. We carry it on the ambulances. We carry it on these squads around here. We measure that stuff in micrograms. That's what we dose it in. A hundred micrograms. We give somebody if your legs are burned up to the point where they're charred, you'll only get about two to 300 mics, and you'll be like, I feel like I can walk. And your legs will be burned up. That's micrograms, that is very, very small. And you gotta think, a milligram of fentanyl is about the size of a couple of grains of sand. And that's a milligram. And we're dosing that stuff in mics. And, and that's the bad thing about it, you don't know what you're touching now. I've heard a rumor that a lot of the times whenever they get pulled over now, there's dust in their carpets with it. So you reach down in there, and you're searching up under them, you just got your hand down, that absorption to your skin right there, you know, I mean, you, you don't think about it. I know back in years ago, they used to talk about carrying cocaine and the uh, baby powder shakers. So if you got a good stop, you just start shaking it on your carpet. Same thing with some of these other drugs that they're doing nowadays. They'll start shaking. And the pills that they're, uh, that they're seeing now, where these people are manufacturing their own 
that uh, propofentanyl and that chlorofentanyl and all that right there, they're just taking the powder and putting it in a pill mold and just mashing it on pill. That's basically what they're doing with it. So it's, it's easier to import in powder form and make pills than it is the other way around. So you've got to be very careful with it because it will it'll absorb through your skin. What's the absorption rate? Through the skin, it, it depends really. I don't know exactly, but it's uh, you got to think about your, the way your body uptakes your skin. Yeah, it, it, the skin's a pretty good barrier. You got to think that anything you stick in a muscle has to reach at least 97 or 96 degrees to actually start to what they call melt. Anything that's injected has got to melt and metabolize down. Your absorption rates are intravenous through the arm or through the vein, uh, PR, which is rectally up the butt. I am in the muscle or intranasal that falls in somewhere between the rectal and in the muscle. So your absorption rates in the skin is more of a, a lower barrier because your skin is made to resist everything. What is the absorption time? You should know something in 15 to 20 minutes as you come in contact with it. <clears throat> yeah. 15 to 20 minutes you may start getting a little lethargic where you, you're like, you're sitting there and you're like, you're not moving as fast as you were on it. Um, you may start noticing that you're starting to get that that kind of unsteady gait when you're walking a little bit, you're like, you feel like your legs are getting a little numb, that type of feeling. You know, kind of like that, um, that stupor state when you start drinking a little bit and you start getting to where you're, you know, you're either that funny drunk or you're that, that loud drunk. You'll kind of start noticing that within 10 minutes to where you're starting to feel that, just that, that warm feeling. Yeah, that's the way it's been characterized. And the longer it progresses, if you don't recognize those right off the bat, the more it progresses, you will go into an unconscious state. Yeah. What's the survivability? Really good. Of this, the one we've heard most about here lately. With the... it, it's good if it's recognized earlier. It's, if it's recognized early to the point where you're like, look, I, I'm not feeling right, I'm not feeling good, <clears throat> bring your toxicology and stuff like that, and get your blood and all that done early on at the hospital, that way they can say, yes, you've been exposed to it, no, you haven't. The biggest thing is inhaling it. If you open up a bag or, you know, you go to check somebody something, you pop it open and all of a sudden it goes on your face, that stuff hits your nose. It's no different than you doing like any kind of other drug with the nose. Yeah. And that's the, the what we call the mucosa. Like how we do it up the nose, the eyes, the tongue, the lips, all that stuff right there. You gotta be very careful because if it hits any part of your eyes, your nose, your lips, or anything like that, the absorption rate's greater. I mean it, it hits pretty quick. But there's no danger uh, if you're in doubt and, and you give it to uh, patient or one of us, there's no danger of it. It's not going to hurt me. Nope, it's not going to hurt me. What kind of reaction are you going to get out of it? No, it's like right it's now, good. take it, spray it in Cliff's nose, and Cliff will have a runny nose for a second. Just remember, it's better to be safe than sorry. Yes. Don't be afraid to use this stuff. Yeah, don't be afraid. Yeah, don't. <laughs> I mean, don't, we know it's expensive, but look here. Yeah. I'd much rather use that than have to call one of your spouses and tell them that you're not going to be home that night because we didn't yeah. use it. Now, I'm say the main reason why we didn't get this is, is for, for our safety, you know. Uh, right now, each of us are going to be supplied with one, not the day, we still have to get the magic device. Uh, that's on back order. I mean, the, the, these are getting so popular that some cities are actually issuing them uh, uh, just out for free because they know they have their own drug areas. Yep. Uh, so everything's on back order, but the main reason why I wanted to get it is when I started saying, First leg up in Ohio, that's yep. it was, where you had to have 10. Mm -hmm. yep. uh, and then start hearing about locally, about the brick house, all these ODs uh, that just happened recently. Uh, we're stopping cars, we're stopping cars are going up and down the interstate, but they're also coming through the city. Um, and the main thing I wanted was to be able to protect our own. And not just us, you know, but we also got a dog, you know, that's going yep. around putting, you know, the dog in the vehicle and it's stepping around. Uh, so that was my next question. About, uh, using it for See, I don't know as far as that on veterinary use. Um, me personally, if it was my dog and it was my partner, I wouldn't hesitate a moment to try it on. Right. As a disclaimer, I don't know because I can't tell you that's the proper route to deal with an animal until not a vet or if they ever had to mess with your dog. But personally, if that's my dog. Most, you know, most dogs are, are have good absorption rates like we yeah. do as far as take up and the nasal, mm -hmm. intranasal. But, yeah. And most of them can take what we take. But sure. only canines can. Yeah. So it'd be worth to find out. I, just, be, just, be, just remember, you yeah. better be safe than sorry. Yeah. And, and definitely don't be afraid to use this stuff right here because, which I mean, I can't speak on behalf of Calvary County Fire EMS or anything like that right there, but I do not see a problem with the county saying, 
hey, you just used yours on yourself or a patient. I don't see where they'd have a problem replacing something that y'all already made an initial purchase. There's no reason for y'all have to keep buying stuff over and over again. I'm, I'm going to work on that tomorrow. Yep. So we're, we're, going to, we're going to address that tomorrow. I addressed it today with one person, and I was told to talk to another person, so we're going to address that tomorrow. Yeah. And it's no different than if you guys are out here securing a scene for us, and y'all shooting somebody, or, you know, having to, you know, you broke your ass on or whatever, and then saying, well, yeah, we kind of need to replace our ass or our bullets that we used to shoot this bag out on the EMS thing. You know, I mean, it's, it's, there's, no, there, there's no reason why we can't replace it, or the county can't replace that, which, like I said, I can't speak on behalf of them, but I don't see where it would be an issue with them. Knowing um, the chief of operations for EMS, Jeff Denny, I think that he'll think that this is a great thing y'all are doing by making the initial investment. Y'all didn't even come to the county and say, hey, look, we'd like to uh, supply our officers with this. Y'all took that step to make the initial purchase. So I don't think it would be a problem with replacing them, but like I said, that will be something that the chief will speak to the um, Chief Denny on to get all that answered and all that. And the one thing about it is, I mean, everybody knows me, everybody knows where I live. If you are in doubt or whatever, you can call me and say, hey, this is what I got, I'm not really sure. Hey, I'll tell you, yeah, I'd do it in a heartbeat. But there's no adverse effects. You give us to kids, you give us to adults. You know what I mean? It's if they're overdosed, you're not gonna, this will not hurt them. This is actually used as what we call a diagnostic drug. It used to be part of what everybody called the coma cocktail, to where if somebody's unconscious and responsive, it's like you just gave them certain <coughs> drugs to see if anything would work. So I mean, yeah, there's no there's no adverse reactions to this right here. Um, what's the the I say fentanyl will absorb through latex for those. I've heard that the fentanyl won't, but the designer fentanyls will. Mm -hmm. Because, the, but nobody cares latex gloves anymore. That's the good thing because it's uh, so many people are allergic to latex. EMS stop caring them. Yeah. We care what's called nitrile gloves, yeah. which are the black nitrile. But latex, since it is a natural membrane, I can see how it could possibly. Honestly, I mean, I really could. Yeah, as long as your gloves are the black nitrile gloves or anything like that right there, I think you're safe. But as far as latex, I stay away from latex because you never know who's allergic to it. Do we have any clients? I keep a box in my car. Do we have any spare ones? I don't know if I know. The last one to reorder was on Greasement there. When we ordered, we get it. Those were latex, wasn't they? No. Those bags were down to about three or four. No, we weren't. No, those weren't. Those were not the blue ones and the latex. I know it sounds crazy. Billy Tucker's got the nice black gloves, the nice gloves up here that I saw the other day. I'm like, man, you know, because I used to carry my own gloves. They were called spiderwear. And they were the black latex short cuff gloves. Because the dexterity is so great. I mean, you could feel, you could have a hand walking on your finger, feel them. But they're still real strong and resist, uh, resistance to things. Um, I want to say they're called spider wear or spider gloves. If it's something that you know you can look into, they will fit under your leather gloves and they will not break. One thing you got to remember though, all your leather gloves that you wear on these calls, leather absorbs. So anything you touch can impregnate in that leather. And when you pull them off from your pockets or just touch other things, you got it. Absolutely, absolutely. So you may want to invest in a nylon type glove, um, get away from the cottons, get away from the leathers, and invest in the nylon ones, the ones that's got the reinforced nylon palms, the synthetic palms, something that you can, that won't pick up like the leather does when impregnate, and you can also scrub out a lot of times, especially on extrication scenes or something like that. If I get anything on my, which the palms are mine are synthetic, but I had a pair of extrication gloves over leather. When I got through extricating, I'd reach down and grab a handful of sand and run them through the palms of my extrication gloves just to clean off anything that may be on them, whether it be oil, grease, dirt, or whatever. You can do the same thing. Just reach down, do a little sand off the ground, run it between your palms real good on your gloves, and that helps out a lot too. I don't think it's actually OSHA approved, but it, it, it's a peace of mind. Yep. Anything else? Like I say, I mean, it's, the world's, it's, it ain't getting no better by no means, so, you know, it's kind of like the old two Pam kids, and the, yeah. I know you remember the Mark II kids mm -hmm. and stuff like that that we used to have to carry on the fire trucks and all that. It cost like $8 million or whatever. Right. They expired. Mm -hmm. You know, hopefully we don't have to get back to that, but with this right here, you know, it's like when I teach TCCC in the level courses and things like that, I'm a firm believer every officer should have an individual first aid kit, an IFAC. I'm 100%, and if you guys have got them, with, especially with two cat tourniquets, big supporter of two cat tourniquets and IPAC kit. If you've got a personal IPAC kit, put this in there with it. I'm a 
big squirter. And do y'all carry any kind of IFACs in individual first aid kits? I got a jump bag. Okay, good. The one thing that I tell people too, the jump bag is great for the car, but you really need something small for yourself. Because how many times have you chased somebody and you've been way down in the woods or something like that, and say that suspect, that perk turns around and shoots you, and now you're shot in the leg and you're like, you're trying to stop the bleeding and you don't have a, a little small life pack or at least a cat tourniquet. I swear about cat tourniquets. I, I, I preach them. If you don't have them, at least it's like $35. Invest in one and keep it on yourself at all times. You know, the old running joke when we do the SWAT stuff was, hey, you carry four, you know, you carry 120 rounds of 5.56, five, but you can't find one place to put a small cat tourniquet. I can, I can tell you right now, Cowley County SWAT team, every one of them's got a cat tourniquet in the same place, and all SWAT makes carry at least two. So if you don't have one of those two, I mean, why we got everybody in here, invest in one, maybe something the department can invest in, and keep it on you at all times. Absolutely, Lord. And then, uh, if y'all have any questions or anything like that, or if y'all want to get together and do the law enforcement first responder, the T uh, the T the which is more of a tactical class, but the uh, TE, the uh, Tactical Emergency Combat Care, is a good eight-hour leper course. I taught it for Man Tractor. I teach it a lot. We can put together small life pack stuff you can carry on you because you know cops are like fire, and we don't like carrying bulky crap around. Speaking of that, um, we should not be leaving. In the car, we should be having them probably on our body so the temperature. Yes. Oh, this? Yes. No, out of direct sunlight. Just out of direct sunlight. Out of direct sunlight. So, so you, and the glove compartment's fine. The glove compartment's great. Okay. Yep. As long as it's out of direct sunlight. And the biggest thing is, don't crush the box because it'll break the vial. I know it sounds corny. You wouldn't believe how many people put these in there and they close them. <laughs> and then they realize, well, this is wet when I go to use it. Right. Yep. Yeah, just out of direct sunlight, heat really doesn't affect it much. Any questions, concerns, comments? Uh, what if somebody's not breathing? Will that kind yes, of work? Yes, that's the, that's the main thing right there. Mm -hmm. Now, if they're not breathing at all, we want to do CPR. Mm -hmm. What I personally would do is start doing CPR. When somebody else gets there, say, hey, man, hand me your Narcan real quick. It's not going to hurt by no means. Yep. Do CPR to get that blood circulating, and then give it to them. Yep. It may be what's needed to kickstart it. Biggest thing now is when y'all search these cars, make sure you wear these gloves. Because the main pill that I think we're right now is Percocet, right? You know what that? Yeah, it's the, it's the, the fake Percocet looking pill. It's a yellow. Most of the time, Percocet's white. Yeah. Percocet's not going to say Percocet on it. Well, I take that back. 90% of the time, Percocet. It's got some kind of two numbers, it's got three numbers. It should have like an H193. I think yeah. H193 is part yeah. of it. Look, do yourself a favor. Everybody's got iPhones. Get this app called Kill Identifier. This thing is great. When I go on people that I know that's overdosed or something like that, and they got pills just in conglomeration, I scoop in mugs up while my crew's doing their thing, running around. As long as there's nothing that I have to do uh, advanced life support wise, I start looking through pills. A lot of times I think H193 is purpose set. Or hide your code on uh, 5325. I'm not exactly sure, but I think it is. That pill identifier app is great. What color is it? What number's on it? And it's it's quick. If, if it has no number on it, it's round, it's white, it's got two hash marks on it, and it'll start showing you pictures and telling you basically what it is. If it don't meet any of the criteria, you know you're dealing with something somebody's made. Because if you go to GNC vitamin shop, things like that, you can actually buy pill molds. All it is is a pill press. Put powder in it. Take lid, push down, it presses a pill with no marks on it. But I can tell you right now, if you ever get a pill that has no marking at all on it, somebody's made that pill. Yep. You get on drug.com and do the one with identifiers also. There you go. Yep. And it's well worth it. It's, it's well worth it. Because, like I said, a couple of grains of fentanyl is milligrams. And that's seriously potent. Yep. And if you don't have a computer available or you a way to get on the internet on your phone call poison control they can not do it also. Yeah. You know when you call poison control, anytime you're anytime you go on an overdose or something like that, you know the number of poison control, it's always a good to have it saved in your phone because they'll issue a case number also. That case number is viable also, like say continuum of care. You go on somebody, say the fire truck is on a call and you know you're gonna be down here because we've been down here before on calls 10 15 minutes if you got anybody EMS wise. If you have someone that's drank something or taken something or ate something or especially if 
we used to have kids get into uh, cardiac medications, old people's cardiac medications all the time. That's the number one killer of kids is, is not drinking the bleach because as soon as the bleach is their tongue, they spit it out. They don't even drink anything, like especially kids. But it's when little Johnny takes all grandma's Barapa meal or takes two or three of those, you know, because that stuff's very hard to reverse and that controls your heart. It slows your heart down, heart down, heart down, and there's nothing we can do for it that quick. And poison control is a key indicator. Poison control will tell you exactly what to do. They'll get the name, the date, the age of the child, start telling you what steps to take, give you a case number, and you can pass all along, all that information along. It's very vital so the hospital can follow up also. And it also starts time stamping so you'll know how long it's been. Yeah. Yep. Anything else? Like I say, if y'all want to do any kind of classes, tactical classes, any kind of first aid classes, or anything like that when it comes to some of the tactical medicine and things like that that you know just you don't really think about because thank God we don't need it right. all that often. But um, just get with the chief and we'll see what we can do about putting together some stuff. We appreciate it. I just want to thank you for doing this. Absolutely. You know, like I said, it's just not for the uh, you know, the department here, for the citizens also. Absolutely. We appreciate you doing it. No problem. No problem at all. Right. 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 right straight here. So I do appreciate it. No problem. Thank you, man. I guess I'm back in there. He's a tape over there. still no problem now. So. What are you doing? How you doing, my team? What are you doing? Uh, I'm on my site. Not to say, wave them all. Turn around, Matt. Matt said he'd like you. I'm about to go home. Hey, Chief. Uh,